We're now going to get into gradient free optimization. This is a very different world than the one we were just in with gradient base. It's also a much broader world. There's a wider range of algorithms and approaches. Uh, we'll talk about some of the popular ones that you may have heard of, like genetic algorithms, particle swarm methods. Today we'll talk about a method called Nelder Mead, uh, one of the more uh, basic methods. Uh, but it's a very broad, there's a very broad spectrum of, of methods. Many of them are, but not all, are uh, biologically inspired and, and use what we would call heuristic approaches. That means that they um, don't have a mathematical, uh, say, derivation, if you will, but they're more inspired by things that are observed uh, in biological systems. Genetic algorithm is, is one example. Uh, if you go, we list some examples in the book, but you'll find a wide variety of things like um, bee colony optimization, ant colony optimization, fruit fly optimization, gray wolf optimization, uh, fish artificial fish swarm, firefly algorithm, water cycle algorithm, it goes on and on. There are others that are uh, more mathematically based. Um, and you know may have a more rigorous convergence, and uh, you know this variety gives us options. Some are going to be more better suited for some problems versus others. So we should talk maybe first um, about when you might use a gradient-free method versus a gradient-based, and maybe address some misconceptions there. Um, <clears throat> so an advantage of gradient-free methods. Uh, perhaps the obvious advantage here is that we don't need the, the gradient anymore. Um, that uh, can be complicated to provide, right? It can be difficult, sometimes challenging, and sometimes we can't. The underlying function may be too noisy. Um, that may be either because it fundamentally is uh, noisy or discontinuous, or just that uh, it's, it's a, a legacy code, a binary that we don't have access to source, so we can't fix any of the noise that exists, right? We just have to deal with it. In those cases, um, it may be difficult to provide accurate derivatives. And so gradient-free methods can be uh, very useful. Um, it can also help us in terms of time, not computational time, but developer time. Um, sometimes getting derivatives, although even though maybe we could do it, maybe we even have the source, but the changes that would be required may be fairly extensive and it may be easier to just uh, use a gradient free approach. Gradient free methods tend to be more forgiving. As we've seen with gradient base, we have to you know, uh, pay careful attention to providing accurate derivatives. If we can do that, there's a lot of power to that, but the gradient frees are, are generally more forgiving. They'll, they'll be more willing to tolerate noise, discontinuities, even failures to converge uh, at some points. Uh, there are some perhaps misconceptions. Um, a gradient free is not necessarily always the best choice, even if it, uh, some of these things occur. So for example, we'll often hear that if your problem is multimodal, you should use a gradient free method because it will give you the global optimum. That's not necessarily true. Um, for one, not all gradient free methods are global search methods. Many of them are local search methods, just like a gradient based. Uh, but it's also the case that gradient base can use, you know, uh, globalization methods where we say have many starting points. Um, and so a gradient free may be still more effective at finding a global optimum, um, especially because many gradient free methods, we don't, uh, by definition, right, we don't have the gradient and that's how we uh, form rigorous convergence criteria. So often many of the methods don't actually converge to an optimum at all. I'll just converge to a point that you know is, is good enough. The function has stopped changing and things. Uh, so it, it's a really a different, depends on what your needs are. Often in industry, that's what we need, right? We don't actually care that we've reached the optimum. Um, we just need a point uh, design that's substantially better. Um, but for many research problems, or if we're comparing different concepts and things, we generally need to make sure that we've really converged well, right? Because otherwise it's hard to compare. If two things haven't converged, they're both better. We can't really draw any conclusions because we don't know how close they are to the optimum. So uh, often uh, for those kind of type of comparative studies, we want tighter convergence. Uh, multiple objectives is something we'll talk about uh, after gradient free. And, and that's perhaps another cause of misconception that gradient free uh, is better suited to multi-objective. Both can be used, uh, it really depends. 
um, whether that's going to be more suitable or not. So there are some methods in gradient free that uh, are well suited for gradient or for multiple object objectives. A gradient base can also be adapted for that. That's something we'll talk about a little bit later. Discrete may be something or noisy is something that may cause us to go to gradient free and often that is the best choice. But sometimes these are things that we uh, are, are perhaps better addressed in the analysis. Discrete problems are much, much harder to solve. And even if we are, even if a gradient free method is a, a, a best choice for a particular method, um, if our algorithm or our analysis is smoother, it'll still benefit. Um, even though it can tolerate the noise, that's not gonna make it more effective to have that noise. So often, uh, if we can, we really wanna pay attention to the numerics of our analysis and that things behave smoothly, even if we don't need those derivatives. And often, uh, if we can address some of those, um, we can, we can you know, have more options in our, in our methods. So uh, there are, it's also not necessarily true that gradient free methods don't converge to an optimum. It depends, right? Like I said, many of them don't uh, have the same rigorous criteria because they don't have a gradient, but there are some mathematically based methods that can converge to, you know, uh, really tight tolerances. Um, and, and there's one example in, in our book, the direct method is an example of that. Um, let me share a plot. So I'm going to share my screen now. This is perhaps maybe one of the more fundamental trade-offs that you'll deal with with gradient-free. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, the multimodality or uh, maybe even the the noise per se uh, or discreteness sometimes, but perhaps problem size is, is a, a, a even more salient feature. So here's a plot of. Um, how many function evaluations were required for this problem? This is a multi-dimensional version of the Rosenbrock function um, versus the number of design variables. And of course, the exact numbers are not really what's important here. Those will vary by problem, but this is a pattern that's seen across problems in general. Uh, it's really more the nature of the scaling that's uh, of relevance. And what we see is that uh, uh, this is the gradient free curve. This is finite differencing using a gradient base. And this is a, you know, using exact derivatives. So for example, algorithmic differentiation or implicit analytic or something, uh, method to supplying derivatives. Um, <clears throat> and, and I should say, this is not the full picture, right? Cause just function evaluations itself doesn't tell us everything, not necessarily everything about cost, but this is a sort of a, a rule of thumb to help us understand some of these trade-offs. And what we see is that for small, this is a log scale, right? So for smaller number of variables, say 10, 20 variables or so. The differences are there, but they're you know within an order of magnitude or two. They're generally not uh, a big determining factor. And this is computational time. We have to consider developer time. So for these smaller problems, gradient-free methods can be very effective, especially because getting down to this curve here where we provide exact derivatives can sometimes take considerable developer time, right? Modifying the analysis so that it's amenable to uh, providing good derivatives. Um, so uh, in these cases, these methods uh, can have great success. The challenge really comes as we get to bigger problems, right? Hundreds, thousands of design variables. Uh, gradient free methods uh, don't scale as well generally as we increase the number of variables. And so it can become quickly intractable here in this case, this is now like, you know, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude. I mean, that's, that's just huge, right? So, um, Again, it's not the exact numbers that matter here, but it's really the idea that getting to bigger and bigger problems uh, is going to drive us towards derivatives. And, and that should make sense on a fundamental level, right? With the gradient free method, we just don't have as much information. We don't have the gradient. In these methods, we have extra information that we're using. So it shouldn't be surprising that they can converge faster, but that does require more work. So it's not always a worthwhile trade off if we don't have large problems and if we don't need. Uh, you know, say uh, as exact, as precise of, of an answer. Um, but it is something that is a limitation as you want to get to bigger problems. If, if we look at, you know, this is a rule of thumb, right? This is not a, a hard number, but um, based on experience and, and papers that uh, I've seen, you know, there are these papers that have taken lots of benchmark problems and engineering problems. And I would say, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 
30 variables is a typical sort of large size for gradient free. Below that, you can usually do pretty well once you start getting significantly above that, right? So 10, 20 variables is a pretty safe. If you're getting up to 50, 100, then uh, 1,000 certainly it can be difficult to, uh, and not always, right? There are some problems that are still well suited, but um, it's often um, gonna be difficult to find a good solution uh, with a gradient free method. Okay, so with that background, let's talk about our first method. This is a, uh, it's called the Nelder Mead method. And this is just to introduce kind of a big level picture here. We're gonna use what's called the simplex and a simplex um, in 2D here, I've got a 2D problem is just a triangle, but in higher dimensions, what we call a hyper tetrahedron. So, you know, like a pyramid, if you will, in three dimensions. And then, you know, whatever that looks like is hyper tetrahedron in, in higher dimensions. So this can be used in any dimension. Um, but the idea is we form this kind of triangle shape. Notice it's not now a point where we're getting a derivative. We've just got kind of this uh, tetrahedron shape. And here's a function, for example, here's some constraints and an optimum. Um, this is just a visual to get you thinking, how might an algorithm like this work? Let's say I gave you the shape and said, create an algorithm that's going to find the optimum. You might consider, uh, might be worth considering, pausing and considering how you might construct such an approach. Okay, so um, let's talk about it. Um, this is called Nelder Mead. Um, so you don't need derivatives, obviously, because that's all the methods we're talking about right now, but just to be clear here. So this has been a pretty popular method um, in, in lower dimensions. So if a gradient based method, you know, say a function has some noise and the gradients are not reliable, keeps getting stuck. Uh, an elder mead can be an effective approach. Um, it's a local method, meaning it's not global, right? We'll talk about some global methods, meaning it's like gradient based, it's going to exploit. It's gonna to try to find an optimum quickly. It's not an exploratory method like some of the others we'll look at. Um, let's say as a rule of thumb, probably about 10 dimensions is about as high as you want to go, maybe a bit more, but as a rule of thumb. So it's it's effective if the problem size is small. Uh, as it gets larger than that, the method is uh, can be a real challenge. It's not a hard and fast rule, but again, you know, as in general, it, it tends to struggle with higher dimensions, even more so than some of the other gradient-free methods. Um, it doesn't explicitly handle constraints. Um, and that's true of many, though not all, gradient-free methods. Uh, many of them have no uh, mechanism, you know, like we do, of course, with gradients, we have this Lagrangian um, and we're computing Lagrange multipliers as well. Uh, that doesn't exist in most gradient-free methods. So we have to do something else, often a penalty function, right? So we'll create an unconstrained problem by forming some sort of penalty. There are some methods that we'll talk about uh, next week that we'll have. Uh, some ways to deal with constraints, but many do not. Okay, so let's let's uh, get into the actual method here. So I'm going to draw it in 2D, but you should keep in mind that this is going to work in any dimensions, so at least conceptually could work. So if I have, uh, let's say, n, I'm, I'm just going to drop the x, but the this is nx, number of design points. So this is my design variables. Then there's going to be n plus 1 points in my tetrahedron. And so uh, each of these is, is, a, is, a, is a design point. So we could order this in an array. Um, let's say x0 is one point, x1, and so on. And I'm going to have up to xn. So I have n plus 1 since I started at 0. And keep in mind, each of these x's is a vector. So if I had um, a, a five-dimensional problem, this x is a vector of length five, and I'm gonna store six of these vectors. And so let's let's just think about the 2D problem here. So it's gonna be easier to draw, I mean, it's really the only one I can draw. So let's say I only have two design variables, then that means I'm gonna have three points, right? Zero, one, and two. So that's gonna be this triangle. I have these three points, let's say X zero, um, X one, and X two. And that defines this triangle here, or this tetrahedron. Um, 
Okay, each of these is a coordinate of dimension two, right? Because it's a, a location, let's say X and Y, if you want to call it that way, or X1, X2. Um, these are vectors of length two, and I have three of these vectors to define the triangle. So again, in five dimensions, these would be vectors of length five, and I'd have six of them to define this tetrahedron. Um, the way we order these by convention, and this will be done the whole time, is that we're going to rank these. So I take each of these X values, each one you could consider, this is my design point, right? It's a set of design variables. I evaluate my objective, and then I'm going to order them. So X zero will always refer to my best design, and Xn will always be the worst design. And, and the others follow in order, right? So this is my second best, and so on. Uh, one quantity we're going to use throughout um, is the centroid. And the centroid is just going to be the average of the points geometrically, right? So it's just going to be um, We'll sum over zero to n minus one, and that's n points. So we'll divide by n. So we just take we just take all the x's. It, all we're doing here is right, is just finding the middle point. Okay, that's going to be x c centroid. Okay, that's just something we're going to use. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, again, the key idea here is that uh, we don't have one point anymore like we did before, right? With gradient base, we have one point. We move that forward. We have n plus one points and it forms this tetrahedron that we're gonna move around to try to find our optimum. And these are ordered from best to worst. X zero is best, Xn is worse. Okay, so let's now discuss all the operations that, that we could use. Um, the first operation is, is called the reflection. Um, and you could think of it as kind of like uh, this approach we're doing is going to be kind of like a line search, only much a little bit rougher, right? So here's my original tetrahedron, x0, x1, x2. The idea with reflection is I take my worst point, here's my worst point in this case, and I'm going to reflect it over the centroid. Yeah, you know what? I didn't describe the centroid correctly. Uh, it's actually the centroid, and I did write it correctly. It's the centroid of every point except for the worst one, right? Because notice how I summed up to n minus one. So I didn't include the last point. So in this case, it actually is here in 2D. So, oops, it's the center point of everything that is not um, except for the worst. So ignore this worst one. And you know, so let's say I've got six points, we ignore the worst one and we take the average of the other five. Okay, so that, uh, yeah, that, that makes more sense looking at this picture now. Okay, so reflection. The idea here again is we take our worst point and we're gonna reflect it over the centroid. So we're gonna say, okay, here's a bad direction. The points are generally better towards the centroid. That's where all the good points are located. So let's go in that direction and we'll go in exactly the same distance that we had here. We'll just reflect it over, we'll flip it over. Okay, so that's what that operation looks like. Um, mathematically, we could write it like this. Uh, the reflected point is my centroid and we're gonna write it this way because actually every operation except for one is gonna look exactly like this. And we'll just change the alpha. Okay, so this says, take the centroid, take this distance here, xc minus xn, add them together times some scalar. And for a reflection, that alpha is one. And all that says is we took this distance, that's this, right? It says take xc plus one times that distance ends up here at reflection. Okay, so this is just a formula to do it. This is my worst point. This is the centroid excluding the worst and alpha is one. So I can compute what xr is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, that's gonna be the first thing I do every time in the simplex is I'm gonna take my worst point and try to head in a direction where things are better. I'm gonna evaluate my reflected point. Now, what's gonna happen, there are many possibilities. One possibility is that reflection point is really good. If it's better than the best point, and where's the best point again? That's X zero, right? If the reflection is better than the best point, then we're gonna say, let's keep going. It's kind of like a line search, say if things are going well, let's keep going. That's going to give us the expansion. So here's where that reflected point was, for example. Right? And let's say it was better than the best, then we'll do, we'll keep going. And so the formula for this is exactly the same. 
it's exactly the same as the one before, except for now alpha is two. So instead of going one times the distance, we went twice the distance. So we'll now check this expanded point. If it is even better than reflected, then we take it. We're done with this iteration. We've got a new tetrahedron. We move to the next iteration. If we evaluate the expanded point and it's not better than reflected, then we'll go back to the reflected point. We'll accept that. Go back to reflected. We accept that. We have a new tetrahedron. Move on to the next iteration. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility, though, is that we evaluate the reflected, and it's um, it's not better than our best, so we're not going to keep expanding. Um, if it's better than uh, our second worst, then we'll just accept it. So we're going to accept most things as long as it's giving us some decent improvement. We don't want to accept it if it's just better than the worst, because here's the worst. And if it's better than only the worst, that means it's now our new worst point, right? Because we just took the worst, and we made this a new worst. So that's not really much improvement, right? It could be marginally better, and we don't really want that. So we'll only accept the reflected if it's at least better than the second worst. And for you know this 2D problem, second worst is just there's just this point right here, right? So if it's better than the second worst, we'll accept it. So there's still more options here, right? So maybe it's not even better than the second worst. So let's say it's between the second worst and the worst. If it's between the second worst and the worst, like these two, right? The function value, it's 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 improved, but it's not even better than our second worst. Then we're going to do what's called an outside contraction. So Reflection was here. So what that means is we did a reflection. Things uh, got a little better, right? They're better than the second worst, but they're not that good. So maybe if we back off a little bit, you know, that might be better because we know the good points are over here. So it makes sense to not go further, but to move closer to the points that we know are already pretty decent. So that's called an outside contraction. Formula here is exactly the same, except for alpha now is a half, right? Instead of taking that full step, we take half a step. Okay, and there's uh, another possibility here is that that reflected point, um, it wasn't even better than the second to worse. It's actually worse than the worst. Okay, it was, we've, we took the reflected point. Um, it didn't improve anything. It's not as worse than the worst. So uh, we're going to try what's called an inside contraction. So maybe we'll evaluate, um, uh, you know, Flipping over maybe was too bad. So we still want to get closer to these ones that we know are good, but we won't go in that direction. We'll come on this side. So there's an inside contraction. Again, form is exactly the same, but it's a minus a half. So instead of that full step, it's minus because now it's on this side and it's a half a step. All right, a minus one would just leave us right where we were. So that's not helpful. So this is a minus a half. Okay, the last step is that, okay, after all of that, everything we did, did not, not improve even above the worst. It was worse than the worst. Everything was really bad. We're gonna do what's called a shrinking operation. We're gonna take every point now and just bring it in towards our best point. So rather than just take that one worst and try to improve it, we're gonna just you know, say, everybody come in towards the best. Hopefully there are better points near it, okay? That's the last step. So uh, the, kind of the big picture here is that we're gonna to try to improve by each iteration, taking our worst point and making it better. And if we can't find something that's gonna do that, nothing is getting better, then you know, we might as well just pull everything in towards our best. And we'll keep doing that. So then you know, we have this new tetrahedron, we, we repeat this process until you know, some sort of convergence criteria. Um, before I talk about it, let's, let's kind of recap this algorithm here. Here's a picture uh, that shows the, the whole algorithm in a pictorial form here. So here's the beginning of an iteration. I've got my tetrahedron. And the first thing I always do is I take my worst point, I reflect it you know, using that same formula that we had. And remember all the formulas are pretty much the same except for shrink. Actually, I didn't write that one down. Shrink is the only one that's a little different than the others because we modify every single one. Um, we go towards the best and we go in that direction. You know, we minus x zero, and gamma is 0.5 normally for a shrink. And we do this for all i, except for zero, of course. So we keep our best point and every other point we're gonna bring in halfway towards our best point. Okay, so let's recap the algorithm again. So starting point reflected as we said, um, 
So the first thing we're gonna check is the reflected better than the best, right? If it's better than the best, we're gonna keep going. We'll try an expansion. So now we try the expansion. Is the expansion better than the best? If it is, take it, it's great. Um, if the expansion uh, is not, right, uh, then we'll take the reflected. So either way, like here, the reflected was really good. It was better than our best, so we're at least gonna take the reflected. But if our expanded is also better, um, we'll take that because it's actually giving us more progress, even though it may not be as good as the reflected necessarily because we're just comparing it to the best. We'll take it. So we'll take the expanded or the reflected. Okay, so that's great if things are better than the best, but there's a big jump down to here. We're, we're gonna be willing to accept the reflected as long as it's better than my second to worst, right? Because remember, n is the worst. So n minus one is the second to worst. I want it to at least improve that much. Right, improving upon the worst is not really that great. So it improves upon the second to worst. We take the reflected, move on. Okay, another case is that it's just bad. It's worse than my worst. Then we'll do this inside contraction. Um, from the inside contraction, we'll say, okay, did it get better? Is it better than my worst? If it is, okay, well, we're at least improving. We'll take it. If it's not, this is not even better than our worst. So it's worse than the worst, shrink. The last option here, means it's between these two, right? It wasn't better than my second to worst, but it wasn't worse than the worst, so it's between the worst and the second to worst. So we'll try the outside contraction. And with the outside contraction, we'll check. Was it better than the reflected? If so, great, take it. If it's not, then this is really bad, so we'll shrink. And that's the whole thing. We just keep repeating it, doing that same process uh, over and over again. All right, let me show you a little demo here. Um, I'll just run it real quick. Um, so let me just change my share. There we go. Okay, so uh, I just implemented exactly what we just talked about here, Python, and I'm just gonna show you what this looks like. Um, I'm doing the Rosenbrock function. And I put an artificial pause in there just so it doesn't zoom past. So this is the optimal point. There are the contours. Here's my tetrahedron and you can see it progressing. It's really shrunk down to this little thing. This is of course tricky because of that valley. So it's doing some reflections. Did a bunch of contractions early on. Now it's doing a lot of reflections as it's moving its way around this curved valley. Um, and each time notice, right? We don't move the entire triangle because that would require three function calls. We're generally just trying to move one point at a time. The only time we do all of them is that shrink and that's kind of our last desperation move. We don't wanna do that in general because right, that's gonna require oops, um, a whole bunch of function calls. Anyway, just showing you one more time just for fun here. It's really shrinking down and then mostly reflections at this point. It's making good progress. Once it gets in the valley, early on, it was kind of struggling at shrink. So each time, like we said, we generally just need to do one additional function call, but it, you know, it's, it doesn't have any derivative information. So it's gonna be a bit less efficient. Um, and of course, I'm only showing this in 2D, but like we said, it can work in, um, in principle, any dimension, but generally, you know, say about 10 dimensions or so, it's usually pretty feasible, um, depending on the problem, right? Uh, sometimes it can work well in higher dimensions. Okay, so that is it for today. Um, next time we're gonna talk about um, genetic algorithms. See you then.